Hi, everyone. Welcome, all of you, to another public dialogue from the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement at Dartmouth College. My name is Marcelo Gleiser. I am a professor of physics and astronomy here, and I also direct this institute, which is generously funded by the John Templeton Foundation. And let me tell you a little bit about the Institute and why we're here today. So the goal of the Institute is to bring together uh, the sciences and the humanities in what I call constructive engagement. So there are many, many questions that we deal with nowadays that cannot be looked at from a one-dimensional perspective. You really need what I call a complementarity of knowledge, of knowing, in order to address them. And for the last four and a half years, we have been doing this with many, many different kinds of public dialogues. And today we are going to tackle one of the hardest and most fascinating questions you could possibly imagine, which is what is life? And believe it or not, it is really hard to define what is life. And I am very, very happy to have two phenomenal experts on this topic, one a scientist, the other one, a philosopher with very scientific inclinations. So let me first introduce them briefly, and then we're gonna have a quick video defining the goal of the Institute, and we're gonna jump right into the conversation, okay? So let me put my glasses so I can read all the details. So Carol Cleland is a professor of the Department of Philosophy and director for the Center for the Study of Life Origins at the University of Colorado in Boulder. She's also a SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute uh, affiliate. And she has written many books, both as an as a, as a editor and as an author. And I, I mentioned two of them, which are related to what we're going to discuss here today. One is called Extraterrestrial Life, A Guide to the Debates. So she is an arena person. She's already telling people, you know, how to, coaching people how to talk about these very complicated issues. And that was um, from 2004. And she has a much more recent one from 2019, which is called The Quest for Universal Theory of Life, Searching for Life as We Don't Know It. And you're going to see that this is extremely important in this conversation about life, not just because of life on Earth and potential potentially different kinds of life that may have existed and still exist on Earth that we don't know about, but also obviously life elsewhere in the universe. And our scientist is Bob Hazen. He's a senior staff scientist at the Carnegie Institute for Science. He's a NASA Astrobiology Institute, part of the so-called Enigma team. That's an awesome name, by the way, I love it. Um, he is a very prolific author, over 350 uh, scientific papers, 20 books. He has written about music, has written about science, has written about also history and many, many different topics. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has received the Distinguished Public Service Medal from, from the Mineralogical Society of Ameri America. And more recently, their biggest accolade, which is the Roebling Medal. And again, I won't mention all his books, but I'll mention a, a few that have to do with what we're discussing here today. One of them is very appropriately called Genesis, The Scientific Quest for Life's Origins, which is from 2007. Another one is The Story of Earth, where you have to tell that story looking both as how the minerals evolved in the last 4.5 billion years and how that is connected, of course, with the de uh, development and evolution of life as well. You cannot pry them apart as we are going to find out today. And very recently, also 2019, he published another book called Symphony in C, a carbon, uh, carbon and evolution of almost everything, which really happens to be <laughs> the essence of life is about. So before we all start our conversation, I'm going to have our short video so you can understand better what is the mission and goal of, of, of the Institute. But let me make two announcements before we do that. The first one is that we are starting a new podcast series, which is being curated by our junior fellow, uh, uh, Franklin Jacobi, and it's going to start very, very soon. And those of you interested should connect with our channel through the ice.dartworth.edu 
um, link, and the interviewees are going to be past fellows, and we have had amazing fellows here, uh, from Tony Aveni to Alan Lightman and, 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 and many, many other amazing people. So these are great conversations. And the other one is that you should all check our video collection also at ice.artworth.edu. And let me just say that this ICE um, acronym came way before 2016. So it's not my fault. <laughs> it's the short for the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement. And it was too late to change it afterwards. And, you know, it became kind of infamous for, for many reasons. But let's leave those aside for now. Uh, so if you uh, want, you should check our video collection where all our past uh, conversations, what we call public dialogues, have been uh, uh, archived and also interviews and, and lectures by uh, our fellows that have been accumulated over the past five years, okay? So without further ado, let's watch our video. Thanks, Jay. The world is a complex place, a network of flowing information and changing patterns where forces known and unknown generate the most sublime beauty and the most terrifying destruction. The world inspires wonder and doubt, and we humans try to make sense of it all, creating stories, theories, symphonies, and poems. I am Marcelo Gleiser, director of the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement at Dartmouth, or ICE. On behalf of all of us at ICE and our partners, I invite you to be a part of our institute, to be a part of this very essential conversation. What is the nature of reality? What is the future of humanity? Will machines think? Will and should we become immortal? Is there free will? Are we alone in the universe? Can science be a path towards spirituality? ICE was created to address these issues and establish new bridges between different ways of knowing. Our mission is to overcome old bigotries and facilitate a constructive dialogue between intellectuals and the general public, creating a community of citizens concerned with the common good, engaging experts, promoting public dialogue, and offering open access courses. One thing is certain, the hardest questions as for different viewpoints, for a cross-disciplinary approach, for intellectual openness. The sciences and the humanities need one another now more than ever, and we need them both. Okay, great. Thanks for watching this. And let me just briefly mention how this is going to go. So each one of our speakers, starting with Carol, will have about 10 minutes to start, you know, discuss their ideas. And then we'll talk among ourselves for about 20 minutes or so. And then hopefully for about another 15 minutes, we'll open for questions from the audience, okay? So welcome both of you. I'm really happy to have you here because this is a topic which is very dear to my heart and I'm sure it's fascinating to many, many uh, people out there. And Carol, why don't you start? Thank you, Marcelo. And thank you so much for inviting me. This is going to be a very fun discussion, I'm sure. So uh, the question is, what is life? What is the nature of life? Uh, this is one of the oldest and most difficult, in my mind, questions that uh, our species has faced. And let me explain to you why I think it's so difficult and why I think, despite the many definitions of life that have proliferated, and I'll say something a bit more about definitions of life and the problems with defining life in a little bit, but uh, the whole project of defining life, uh, you know, is based on the idea that, well, from life as we know it, on Earth today, we can actually somehow grasp from our studies of it uh, the nature of life elsewhere uh, in the past, in the present, and elsewhere in the universe. So I think this is a mistake. And let me explain to you why I think it's a mistake. And not only do I think it's a mistake, but I think we have good scientific reasons and philosophical, logical reasons for thinking it's a mistake. So I'm going to start with some of the scientific reasons. Uh, so 
scientists have shown that all life on Earth, all life that we know of, all known life on Earth, is descended from a last universal common ancestor. And this is underscored by the fact that um, all known life on Earth is shockingly similar uh, in its biomolecules. Its biomolecules include, uh, I'm going to focus on these two proteins uh, and lipids and nucleic acids. I'm going to focus on, uh, sorry, and uh, on uh, proteins and nucleic acids uh, for purpose of this discussion. So all life on Earth, from the simplest bacterium to a jellyfish, to a bird, to a tree, builds its proteins out of 20 amino acids. And we know there are over 100 amino acids uh, that are available prebiotically on Earth. And yet, and we know that many of these could form proteins, which are just strings of amino acids, that would be functional in the right organismal environment, but nothing on Earth uses them. Not a tree, not a bacterium, not you, not me. Uh, not an elephant, not a jellyfish. So that's really striking because biochems have shown us that you can build perfectly functional proteins out of alternative sweets of amino acids, but no, nothing on Earth uses them. Similarly with nucleic acids. All life on Earth uh, uses four nucleic acid bases to uh, code for proteins. Uh, this is the information. Nucleic acids are DNA and RNA, are the informational molecules, which store hereditary information and code for those amino acids, which reform the structural and build our bodies and the catalytic functions that keep us moving and breathing and going and doing things. And yet, um, all life on Earth uses only four bases, and biochemists have shown their alternative bases that would make perfectly functional nucleic acids, DNA and RNA in the right organisms and environment. Similarly with the sugars in the sugar phosphate background of the famous double helix in DNA. Um, we know there are alternative sugars that would make perfectly functional uh, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA in the right organismal and background. But yet nothing on Earth uses them. Not a, no known Earth uh, life uses them. And the same with the genetic code. Um, I could I'll talk about the triplet coding scheme. We know there are alternative coding schemes uh, given different suites of bases and amino acids. Uh, and there's also the, new, uh, the, uh, uh, the genetic code, which uh, pairs uh, triplets of uh, bases to amino acids to build proteins. We know that code could be different. So we know life on Earth could have been modestly different. And yet, all life on Earth is shockingly similar. Uh, at the um, level of its basic biomolecules. So this is really stunning and one of the reasons that people know that all life on Earth descends from a last universal common ancestor, affectionately known as LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. So um, in this context, it's important, and this is a philosophical point and a logical point, to keep in mind that it's very risky generalizing from a single example. And let me give you uh, just a kind of playful illustration. Supposing you have some aliens that come down and they want to uh, they want to come up with a definition or a theory of mammals. And all they have available is one kind of mammal, zebras. What are the characteristics of zebras do you think that they're going to generalize based upon? Well, the universal feature of zebras are their stripes. But we now know that actually those aren't the important features uh, that make something, an animal, a mammal. It's their mammary glands, and only among other things, but the mammary glands are critical. It's part of the definition of mammal. And uh, yet only half of uh, zebras and other mammals have them. And this is a good illustration about the problem with trying to generalize based on Earth life. What characteristics are you going to choose to base your generalization upon. Um, all of the characteristics, the characters are, that are common to all of Earth life, but then we have our zebra worry. Maybe those aren't the critical characteristics. Maybe those are accidental characteristics, like the stripes, characteristics that have to do with the particular circumstances of zebras, uh, the particular circumstances of Lucas, 
uh, chemical and physical origins on this earth, circumstances that wouldn't be uh, present on another world which supported life. So we have this serious problem of generalizing based on a single example. And it's important to see that life is different than water. People go, oh, well, you know, same thing is true of water. How can you generalize about water since our experiences with water are experiences with the stuff on earth that we call water? The difference is that we have reasons, scientifically based reasons for thinking that life on earth is a potentially non-representative example of life. And that those reasons are just what I talked about, that biochemists have shown that life could be at least modestly different in its critical biomolecules, and we don't, and they don't know how different it could be. And this brings me to the very popular uh, project of defining life. In scientific circles, people are very eager to define life because they want to go to some place like Mars or now Venus is the newest uh, exciting place to go. And they want to be able to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down as to whether they found life. So ideally, if they went with the definition of life, and keep in mind that definitions provide necessary and sufficient conditions for the application of a term. So for example, if you define the term bachelor as unmarried human male, and it's a truly a, a logically um, acceptable definition, um, it's going to be the case that anything that's an unmarried human male is going to be, by definition, a bachelor. And anything that's a bachelor is, by definition, an unmarried human male. In other words, definitions basically lock in uh, what counts as life or not life. Either you satisfy the definition or you don't. And if you don't, it's not life. And if you do, it is life. Uh, and there's no question uh, beyond that, because if it's a definition and it gives you necessary and sufficient condition, which are what really good logical definitions do, then you've completely encapsulated what it is to be a living thing. So the difficulty is definitions are based on human concepts. So if we give a definition of life, we are dissecting our current concept of life the human concept of life, which alas is based on a single example of life. And here's the real risk. That single example, as I just discussed, may be unrepresentative. So you might go to Mars, run into a really different form of life, and the problem is you would not uh, be able to recognize it as a living thing because it wouldn't satisfy your definition if it didn't meet whatever characteristics of life you picked out as being truly um, the correct characteristics to define life. And the problem is that the kinds of characteristics people choose in their definitions of life are always universal characteristics of life. So we run into our zebra problems. We're going for what is it they all have in common? Well, it's going to be the stripes for zebras, but that's not, we now know, the critical feature of the characteristics of mammals. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the whole project of defining life is really fundamentally self-defeating because what it will mean is that you will be able to find uh, life, according to your definition, if it's like our form of life, but you're not going to be able to find it if it's different. And yet when we go to Mars or Venus or uh, Titan, that's my favorite place to go, by the way, um, you might discover a form of life that's very different than Earth life, and you want to be able to at least recognize that we've got an anomaly here, something that sort of meets the characteristics, some of the characteristics of familiar life, and yet fails to meet the other characteristics. And so the challenge here then is you don't want a definition to completely blind you because it doesn't satisfy all the characteristics that you have uh, viewed as universal to familiar Earth life. So I think that's my 10 minutes, Marcel. Hi. Okay, that was perfect. Thank you so much. Um, there are many, many things to to talk about and to unpack from this, from what you just said. So we're going to get there. But now, Bob, why don't you take over and give us your presentation as well? Thank you. Thanks so much, Marcelo, and and thank you, Carol. It's it's wonderful to hear a philosophical. <laughs> Um, sort of disposition on what is life. But, you know, I'm a geologist. I, I'm a mineralogist. I was trained to go out in the field and pick up rocks. And I know life when I see it. I mean, 
you know, this is here. here this is alive. It's, it's got all those characteristics. It um, it grows. It responds to stimulus. It reproduces. It's sort of a separate, isolated thing, and it's it's in this beautiful pot. I, you know, that's alive, and we all know that. We don't have to be philosophical. We know that's alive, and it contrasts with what I'm interested in as a mineralogist. And this is a crystal of quartz. Now, it's true this crystal grew at one point, but it it's not alive. It's it it doesn't respond to stimulus. It doesn't um, reproduce. It's a quartz crystal, and so we have things that are alive, and we have things that are dead. And that's probably the way most of us think about it, because we are human beings. And as the great anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss told us, that we tend to think in dichotomies. Now, that's important. In his book, The Savage Mind, he talked about primitive cultures, where when you came across someone you didn't know, or you came across a phenomenon you weren't familiar with, you had to decide very quickly, is this good or bad? Is it friend or enemy? And that need to divide our experience into either or situations is very powerful. It plays out hugely in today's political environment, as I'm sure you know, in many other cases as well. So dividing the natural world into living and not living is a natural thing to do. Um, but surely scientists don't fall into that trap, do they? We wouldn't do that. Well, unfortunately we do. And then from my own field of earth science, I can give you three sort of amusing historical examples. One from more than 250 years ago when there were a group of geologists who said all rocks form from water. They were called Neptunists. And they were at odds and they argued and they fought with the people who were called Plutonists that said rocks form from heat. False dichotomy. Because rocks form from water and they form from heat and they even form from combinations, something called metasomatism. And then 200 years ago, there was the debate between the uniformitarianists and the catastrophists. The catastrophists said all of geological features arise as a consequence of great catastrophes, floods, volcanoes, and that that's what formed the surface of Earth. But then the uniformitarianists said, no, what forms Earth are gradual processes that integrate over very, very long periods of time. And that's the main. Well, of course, again, false dichotomy. They both occur. We know that there are asteroid impacts and there are mega volcanoes, but there's also gradual processes. And each of those can, can form gradual changes. But, you know, that's hundreds of years ago. Surely in our modern time, we've gotten beyond that. But from my own personal experience, I can tell you, no, we haven't gotten beyond that. When I first got into the origin of life game in 1995, I was interested in the possibility that was just being real raised because people were finding these vibrant black smoker communities on the floor of the ocean where you had all sorts of interesting uh, life forms living in hot, high pressure water. So what's the possibility that there could be interesting chemistry that happens at extreme pressures and temperatures of the ocean floor environment of volcanic environments and that that might have contributed to the origin of life. So we began to do some experiments. Now, I thought that one of my scientific heroes, Stanley Miller, would like this. Stanley Miller is the famous person who, with, with Harold Urey, designed a tabletop experiment in the 1950s that was able to show just by using simple gas molecules that would have occurred in the atmosphere and using little simulated lightning bolts, electric sparks, you could make all sorts of interesting molecules. For example, the amino acids that Carol just told you about. Amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. Well, Stanley Miller did that experiment when he was, when he was in his early 20s. And I think, sadly, he fell in love with that experiment so much that he then spent most of the rest of his life rejecting anybody who said anything different, including us in the 1990s. It was, it was a really unpleasant experience because he was saying, it has to be the surface of the earth. And then we were tempted to say, oh, no, it has to be the floor of the ocean. And of course, again, this is a total false dichotomy. You can do interesting organic chemistry at the surface of a planet. You can do it deep in the oceans. You can do high in the atmosphere. You can do it anywhere. And all of those molecules may have come together in some environment to foster the origin of life. So beware of false dichotomies. Beware of this. And beware of this in terms of what is life, the what is life question so easily falls into that trap. And I think Carol has beautifully shown us that it's more nuanced than that. But let me show you what I mean by being more nuanced. Ah, back to this beautiful plant. Well, is the plant alive? Yes, but 
it isn't alive unless it's in this pot with soil. And that soil is rich in other organisms, uh, mycorrhizal fungi that, that form part of the root systems in a symbiotic relationship. All the different kinds of things that, that break down the soil and the water that goes into the soil. And of course, the air, and, and in particular, the carbon dioxide from the air. And where does that carbon dioxide come from? Well, a lot of it comes from volcanoes and certainly before human activities, that was the principal source of CO2. So is this plant alive or is this plant plus the soil alive or is this, plus this plant plus the soil and the atmosphere in which it survives alive? Because without it, it couldn't be alive. So is it the entire system that's alive? What is it you're saying that's alive? And, and then we get other, is an apple alive? Well, this is picked from a tree. If we just let it sit here on my, my desk, it would die. But it has seeds, and the seeds have the potential for life. And here, for the first time, we're seeing that part of the definition of life has to include the variable of time, the implication of potential. And we can play that game in, in a reverse. Look. Oh. I love fossil trilobites. This is from about 350 million years ago. You know, it's not alive. It's it's a rock now, but we look at it and we know it's it's got these incredible eyes and and in the the many segments of its body, it was alive. So again, there, there's a temporal aspect to asking questions about life. If we go to another world, it's very likely we, we might find a world in which we see fossilized life. We don't see current life because the environment is no longer possible. So so when you talk about what is life, you often can't use the simple yes, no, or just a set of characteristics. You have to think about this temporal aspect. And so in closing, I want, I want to make the emphasis that when we look at what is life, we're really talking about, in our experience, planetary systems that have a history. And it's not simply whether or not there are living organisms on that planet. It's whether the entire system has a set of processes that is conducive to this strange, self-replicating, complex, um, responsive thing that we call life. That's why as a geologist, I'm so excited about this dialogue with Carol. I'm excited in part because when I was a graduate student and a mineralogy major, my professor, my thesis advisor said, don't take a biology course, you're never going to use it. And now as a mineralogist, I look at the world and realize that almost all of the mineral diversity we see on earth today, from soils, from rocks, from the ocean floor, is a consequence, is a feedback loop from biology because of the co-evolving geosphere and biosphere. And my final point, making this transition from life, the origin of life was a transition from geochemistry to biochemistry. But how do you define, was there a point in time? Was there a moment? Was there a place that the first life form occurred? Or rather, is this just a gradual continuous process and where you draw the line is arbitrary? So with that, I'm looking forward to our conversations and your questions. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much. You gave me a lot of ammunition. I love it. I love it. So um, let's see, how can I start? Um, all right. So, Carol, a question. Um, you know that NASA has a famous or infamous kind of operational definition for life, right? Okay. You look like it's an infamous to you. Um, and if you could repeat that. But the reason why I'm asking you that question is that in it, there's something about natural selection. And naively, I wonder, I wonder you know, um, is natural selection an absolutely necessary ingredient for any kind of life? So, you so uh, that's a good question. And I do have an answer to that. Uh, so you're talking about the chemical yes. Darwinian definition of life? As I, okay, well, the chemical Darwinian definition of life, the chemical part is very vague and open, so it allows for non-carbon-based chemistry. Its very vagueness, however, uh, makes it um, able, makes it fail, really, um, to provide necessary and sufficient conditions because it, it's just so open-ended. Uh, the Darwinian 
is also potentially problematic because you're asking now, what do you mean by Darwinian? Well, the classic Darwinian account, of course, is uh, the count that Darwin came up with, where you have a um, <clears throat> to have Darwinian evolution, you have to have um, basically lateral gene transfer from uh, parent to offspring, you have mutation to supply her her uh, her a basis of heritable variation, and the natural selection operates on that. Of course, we now know that that's not quite exactly how all life on Earth does it, because we have uh, bacteria uh, and archaea, uh, single prokaryotes that engage in gene swapping, where you don't need the lateral transfer. You actually can have an organism that can acquire genes from uh, while it's alive from another organism and just literally acquire heritable variation. It's as if I shook your hand and uh, you know your um, I don't have red hair anymore. I used to. Your hair turned red. Um, so. Um, you know, and so you would need to um, actually have a mutation uh, which would pass down a gene to your offspring that would get red hair in virtue of having a mutation. So, so there are these problems, but I think a graver problem actually is imagine a world which um, is very, very stable. Uh, this world uh, would be one in which basically uh, the mutations that provide the source of heritable variation for life uh, on Earth uh, would be actually deleterious. That is to say, they would already be well adapted to their environment. And in being well adapted to their environment, what you would have is, um, you know, when you have a mutation, it would be almost exclusively deleter deleterious. And so uh, natural selection would be... Um, operating on uh, disadvantageous characteristics. And so what you might find is that um, even if you sort of evolved originally with from a Darwinian um, basis, you might find that Darwinian evolution will be very suppressed. Mm. Yeah, um, the reason I was asking is that I was trying to connect what Bob said with what you were saying in the sense that um, if life, if the boundary of life of a living creature is so hard to define, and if natural selection is really about the coupling of a living organism with the environment, that is in a, in a sense helping this broadening of the definition of life. Do you think, Bob? So I think we have to be even broader than that. Okay. Because when we think about what is life, we're really talking about a question of taxonomy. Now, as a mineralogist, we define crystals on the basis of their composition and crystal structure, and it's pretty easy. But when you talk about life, first of all, as Carol said, we don't know what might be out there. But even on our own planet, our viruses alive? Are prions, which are proteins that can fold and do interesting things, alive? Are there other chemical systems uh, that, that are alive? And what I think is the problem is Again, it's not just a false dichotomy, but we don't understand all the taxonomic richness of things that might be called interesting chemical systems that do really fascinating things um, that display characteristics that we might call growth or reproduction or, or response to stimuli. And life is one thing on a spectrum of all sorts of possibilities. One of the things interesting about the NASA definition is, is it does not allow for electronic life. So if you had a set of interlinked computers that somehow became self-aware, according to NASA, that would not be life. But again, consciousness is one aspect or attribute of some things that are alive. And so perhaps that's another part of the taxonomy that has to be developed. It's not just some things are alive, some things are dead. It's that you have this richness of intriguing natural states. And nature is messy. Gosh, I love it for, for being so messy. So can I just respond to Bob? Yeah. So I think we have to be really careful not to assume that because something is conscious or intelligent, that it's necessarily alive. I don't. It's not clear to me that those two go together. That is to say, one might have a computer that was a um, you know able to uh, certainly be extremely intelligent, um, you know be something other than the kind of expert systems we have now have exhibited general intelligence. It might or might not be conscious, um, but if it were conscious, 
it's not clear to me that we'd want to call it a lie. I think that there is this tendency because, again, it's reasoning from a single example. We know of one case of consciousness, right, mm -hmm. that we're really sure of, and that's ourselves. I suspect that most mammals have rudimentary consciousness. I think my cat uh, is uh, a conscious being. Not, you know, he's sentient. He feels pain. Uh, I think he has a minimal self-awareness. Uh, so, again, where uh, and birds, I think it's also true of birds, but again, we're reasoning from a single example. And as we get more and more sophisticated computer systems that are able to do more and more uh, things that exhibit general intelligence, the question of self awareness will arise. Of course, the big problem with self awareness is that truly I only know that I am self aware. Self awareness, as philosophers have struggled with this whole concept for a long time, self awareness is really a very peculiar concept because it's kind of this inner uh, uh, inner notion of being a subject of experience. Mm -hmm. And I only know of one subject of experience of which I can be sure of, and that's me. I assume that Bob is a subject of experience, but you know, I, I don't have access to his consciousness. I can see uh, his other characteristics. I can see his eyes and a nose. And uh, uh, and I can see that he's wearing a blue shirt and I can see his motion. And if a, neur a neurosurgeon were digging around in uh, Bob's uh, brain, they would find all kinds of blood and gray and you know messy stuff. But they're not going to find what he's thinking about now. They might see patterns that are correlated with what he's thinking now. And they might even be able to predict a sophisticated neuroscience might predict what he's thinking about, but that's not the same thing. We have to carefully distinguish causation from identity. Mm. That's not the same thing as what he is actually thinking about. And I always ask my students to imagine a fluorescent green spot. And now imagine a neuroscientist digging around your brain. They're not going to find a fluorescent green spot. Mm. They're going to find some activity. And maybe every time you have an image of a fluorescent green spot, uh, you have this activity, so they could predict you're experiencing a fluorescent green spot. But consciousness, self-awareness is really peculiar in that way. So I would, I would like to. I think, I think the problem of life is hard. I think the problem of consciousness is thus far intractable. Yeah. But I don't think <laughs> the, 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 the point is what we're really, really you know, is thinking about it. the different aspects of a taxonomy of which consciousness could be one part for one group of organisms. Uh, response to stimuli could be another part. Um, any of the characteristics we think might be related to life could be put into the taxonomic description. And so I'm, I'm thinking right now, we're sort of at the stage in understanding what is life is, we just need to catalog, you know, what is a virus without saying whether it's alive or dead? What is a prion without saying whether it's alive or dead? And that, and in fact, use the word life almost thwarts us in this process because we're tending to think of life and live and dead. Whereas think of it just as a rich spectrum of chemical states that's out there that do interesting things. So, so I think it's interesting that um, you mentioned viruses because of course they're um, the reason they're usually, so there's this really, Ironic. I think we have a time lag here with me, so I hope the audience isn't too bothered by that uh, between my, what I'm saying and my expression. But um, uh, what's interesting about viruses is that people declare that they're not alive because they don't metabolize on their own. Uh, but they do exhibit Darwinian evolution. So I always find it really ironic that all these people who are very uh, happy with Darwinian. They think Darwin, Darwinism, they follow Dawkins, that Darwinism is the universal characteristic of life. They still deny they can be living things because they don't metabolize, which just shows you our kind of, I don't know whether to call it schizophrenia about um, life that, you know, we say one thing, we try a definition, and then we sneak in the other stuff is kind of the point Bob was making earlier. Um, so yeah, I, I have the same situation when I was in grade school, this, this will date me, I'm afraid. But when I was first learning biology, when I was maybe in sixth or seventh grade, I was told everything's either a plant or an animal. And then there were these little swimming things. I think they were called paramecium where they had chlorophyll in them, but they were swimming around and they didn't seem to be plants. Well, it turns out they had to expand the taxonomy to include certain types of single cell 
uh, organisms, Monera, and then it was bacteria, and then they added archaea. And, and so a taxonomy has to be flexible. It has to respond to what you actually observe in nature rather than pre saying, okay, anything with chlorophyll is a plant, anything that moves around is an animal. Well, okay, that's too restrictive. There may be other interesting states and we should just embrace nature and let nature tell us what's out there and then maybe even abandon the term life for something that's more um, universal in terms of chemical organization, states of com cosmic chemical organization. Yeah, can I, can I say one thing about that? Because that's kind of interesting. Um, but would you say that you then need to kind of create different categories of what life might be? Because, for example, um, all these examples that we're discussing are biochemical examples in the sense that carbon and water seem to be absolutely essential for everything that we know of, right? And there is a reason why carbon is so important in, in biochemistry, because it's incredibly versatile. You, know, you can do all sorts of things that other potential, um, like silicon, other uh, chemicals would not. So there may be boundaries that you can define. I mean, let's call it the, the, the minimum needed stuff, right, that you need to kind of build from, right, at least from a biochemical perspective for life. And carbon and water seem to be it. But there's science fiction writers that have for or decades talked about possible um, life forms that are developed through self-organization in clouds or plasmas or, or other types of media that are, that are not bounded in the same way that a cell would be bounded. And I don't think our imaginations can, can really get embraced. And so as a scientist, what I said, well, we just have to go out there and see what's out there and, and not have firmly in mind, oh, we're looking for life as if that's an absolute unambiguous thing. I think we should go out and look for interesting chemical phenomena, physical phenomena, phenomena of self-organization that we may not have experienced before and then create a taxonomy around that. And if they're sufficiently analogous to cellular life on earth, we can say it's this one kind of thing, but if it's very different and still has interesting chemical properties of reproduction and for example, you can imagine a surface coating that responds to its environment, that, that grows outward, that breaks off, that mutates when it hits a different kind of mineral surface. That would be very different from cellular life on Earth. It might have a completely different chemistry, but I wouldn't want to just reject it. Well, it's not life, so we're not interested. No, it's a really fascinating chemical system, and it could and, have been a proto-life. Yeah, and, and I think what I uh, have argued in my book and a paper that came out in Astrobiology Biology uh, the June before last was that we ought to really be looking for potentially biological anomalies, not life per se. And the idea, it, it fits exactly with what Bob just said. The idea here is that you go and look for systems that exhibit characteristics that uh, are associated with life on Earth and yet have other characteristics that aren't and would make you think that if you were going with the definition, you would just simply say, oh, this can't be alive and reject it as some sort of weird um, abiological, self-organizing, or whatever chemical phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So I think that if you go looking for potentially biological, you don't just look for any anomalies, although I think anomalies in general are interesting, but if you're looking, if you're being an astrobiologist and you're looking for life, you're going to go looking for potentially biological anomalies. And these are character these are things which exhibit some of the characteristics that uh, we associate uh, with life in general on Earth. Uh, and they also have characteristics that by any uh, particular definition of life would get them classified as non-living. These are the best candidates for expanding our concept of life beyond uh, that of life on Earth. And so I think the big problem is this obsession with definitions doesn't allow you to do that. And I want to go back to silicon a minute because I happen to be a silicon fan. Um, Dirk Schultz McCock, who's a, um, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, um, who is an astrobiologist, has argued that on Titan, uh, silicon forms much more interesting uh, polymers uh, than it does under Earth conditions. It, and these would be conditions of uh, low temperature, little liquid water, uh, and I can't remember what the other conditions are, but he's argued that on Titan, 
you, I might actually get silicon performing like a backbone, uh, the, the kind of backbone carbon does. And the problem is that when you do your uh, experiments on Earth with silicon, they, it's been rejected as doing this in virtue of the fact that the conditions in the laboratory that are used are too Earth-like. And this is typical, I think, of laboratory experiments on Earth. You have to pick a selection of conditions to do your experiment. So what conditions, you aren't going to just select every possible condition. What conditions are you going to select as relevant? And so when we go to other worlds and we discover they have really weird conditions, then we have new fodder for doing our experiments on Earth um, that we might not have even considered before. So sure. I don't think we should reject silicon uh, out of hand because it doesn't form nice uh, polymeric structures like uh, proteins and nucleic acids on Earth. If you think about it, imagine some um, non-carbon-based aliens that came down to Earth and discovered uh, well, let's just do it this way. Imagine some non-carbon-based um, life that's doing experiments in their laboratory. They're not going to come up with nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are, you know, DNA and RNA are bizarre molecules. They're huge. They're complex compositionally. And you're just not going to concoct something like that in the laboratory unless you know it already exists. Yeah. And, and if, what if I dial the sci-fi button way up? And consider, you know, one of our fellows was this uh, Irish writer uh, called Mark O'Connell, and he wrote this wonderful book on transhumanism. And in the book, I mean, he talked about meeting all these transhumanists, but he also talks about the transhumanist dream, right, which actually resonates a lot with the Arthur C. Clarke uh, beings on 2001, which is the essence of the idea being that getting rid of the carbon prison and becoming pure information, which is transferable from re receptacle to receptacle, that receptacle being for us now a computer, but good God knows what it could be, right? So if that is true, if we think of life not so much as biochemistry, but in terms of information, mm -hmm. doesn't that kind of broaden the horizon of what you could be calling life in a big way? Absolutely, and, and this is a really fundamental point. Here's another attribute that is certainly associated with every living thing we know. There's vast amounts of information that's stored, that's replicated, that's passed from one generation to another. So we think of information as being one of those sort of characteristics, and sometimes the word complexity is used. Well, there's incredible gradations in the natural world of systems that store, that can replicate information and that are complex. And once again, if, if we sort of limit ourselves to thinking in just one narrow way about things that are lifelike and then everything else is just sort of, well, that's just chemistry. I think you're missing this kind of, it's not even a gradation from geochemistry to biochemistry. It's an incredibly rich multidimensional fabric of, of reaction systems and networks, uh, some of which convey information, some of which um, retain complexity. And I think we need to, just expand our mind and, and I'll get back again to the word taxonomy. It, it's, a, it's a sort of a boring old fashioned word in one sense, but science can't make progress until we have a taxonomy. I couldn't be a mineralogist if there wasn't a taxonomy of more than, more than 5,000 kinds of minerals. And biologists would have a difficult time going into a new you know, tropical island with all the different kinds of fauna and flora if they didn't have a taxonomy in which to place things in context. We do not have that context for life, for things, and I'm using life now in not the dichotomy sense, but in the sense of all the different complex, multi-dimensional ways that chemistry can introduce complexity to an environment. Okay. Yeah. So let me, I have real problems with electronic life, and let me tell you why. I think that it exhibits uh, the fact that people talk so are so excited about electronic life shows you just how little we know about life. Uh, because there is a tendency when you uh, are really ignorant about a phenomena to go for the most general thing you can think of. I'm not denying that complexity isn't uh, a necessary condition for life. That's not the same as the definition of life, however, because definitions have necessary and sufficient conditions. But the problem with um, electronic life is that it's like uh, you go to the most general level and say, oh, well, 
maybe uh, something that was a simulation of life, and there have been people that have actually claimed to do like like Ray, uh, this uh, computer scientist named Ray created this little ecology with these little organisms in a computer uh, that he claimed were really living things because they exhibited Darwinian evolution. Uh, and a lot of people who are fans of Darwinian definitions are real big fans of electronic life because Darwinian definition is easy to simulate on a computer. The problem is that um, you're at too high level of abstraction. We need a Goldilocks level of abstraction that's not too high and not too low. And let me give you an example. So supposing uh, all, all, chemis all chemicals have mass, right? All chemicals have mass, but merely referring to mass is not going to tell you about chemical reactions. You need more specificity to talk about particular uh, reactions uh, such as uh, oxidation. Uh, it's not enough to say uh, that something with mass, just talking about mass is going to explain the phenomenon of oxidation. So there is this risk when you go to electronic life that you've missed something really important about life. I you know, just, just personally think that life's probably a chemical phenomenon. Uh, and I think you can simulate it, but let's consider the crystal that Bob held up earlier. Um, would a simulation of that crystal in a computer be, I, was that a quartz crystal, Bob? It was indeed, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hold it up again. So <laughs> would a simulation in a computer uh, in great detail be a quartz crystal? Would you really want to call it a quartz crystal? Or would you want to call it a simulation of quartz crystal? It might tell you a lot about quartz, by the way. But would it be quartz? And the same thing, would a simulation of uh, photosynthesis be photosynthesis? Uh, could you eat the products, the sugars, of a simulation of photosynthesis? And it doesn't do to say, oh, I can create a, a simulated organism that will eat my simulated uh, photosynthesis uh, product of sugar because that isn't the same as sugar. So I think we have to be very careful to distinguish a simulation from what's uh, often called the real McCoy. Now, does that mean that we won't discover that life is purely informational phenomena? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that in the history of science, there is this problem of hitting the right level of abstraction to explain a phenomena. And chemistry hits a level of abstraction that is more detailed, more specific than uh, say, uh, physics. And uh, similarly with biology is more, you know, we have biochemistry. Uh, and then we have molecular biology. It, I don't think it's an accident, but I don't know at what level uh, is the right level to understand life. So I understand what you're saying. I would just say from a taxonomic point of view, if you have an electronic system that can um, think in some way that can undergo Darwinian evolution, that is keep bootstrapping itself to higher levels. That's an interesting natural, or, or it's an interesting physical chemical system that it's certainly made of atoms because it's got silicon components um, and it's, it's doing some interesting things. So it becomes part of our taxonomy and saying whether it's alive or not alive is less interesting to me than just being able to characterize the kinds of systems that we find in the natural world. Yeah, one one interesting comment, and then we're going to go. We should go to questions. We have a few from the audience, but um, um, which is the fact that when you talk about simulation and non-simulation, right? A simulation is a simulation to an observer, and and so it is really important to situate the experience of what is happening, you know, and um, and so clearly to someone observing a simulation on a computer, that thing is not the same as the reality of whatever it is being simulated. But if you could, in principle, recreate the same sensorial input of that simulation into someone's brain that is not aware that this is a simulation, that person would have a real hard time distinguishing what is going into the brain from a simulation on a screen. So the boundaries are really kind of difficult. We're putting the simulation in, oh, am I unmuted? You're good, you're good okay. again, it's just a major delay, yeah. Okay, uh, note that um, you're, what's going on is in the brain, not the simulation. What you've done is hook the simulation into the brain. What's yeah. really going on is the wet stuff in the head. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear that the simulation 
in itself can be said to be conscious or aware, etc. I'm not saying that that's not the case. I'm saying that we're again extrapolating from a single example. Mm. Consciousness we only know of uh, in living things, and right. so you know, do we extrapolate uh, what we think is in, you know most abstract feature of it? I guess we have that delay going on again. Um, or do we, um, you know, we just, I don't think we know the answer to that, but I do know that talking about mass, which is a general feature of all chemicals, uh, mm -hmm. is not going to, t and, and, and even in quantum chemistry, you know, if you go to chemistry below quantum chemistry, they're not doing quantum mechanics. So the question is, what is the right level of abstraction for understanding a phenomenon? It's not at all clear that the highest level of abstraction, often we go to the highest level of abstraction when we have no idea what the right level of abstraction is. I call it the Goldilocks level of abstraction. That's what we're hunting for. I got I mean, it. Right. To me, it seems that as a scientist, what you want to do is be able to measure something. Mm -hmm. And so if you can measure a set of attributes or characteristics and see that they form a distinct cluster of attributes or characteristics, something that we do in a field called cluster analysis, then that can constitute a distinct thing, a type or a taxa. Now, think about biology before they had microscopes or could, or could see individual microbes, uh, especially the, the tiny archaea and so forth. Um, before you could measure it, it couldn't be part of your taxonomy. And perhaps what uh, uh, Marcelo is, is saying in this case, too, that there are attributes of electronic systems, uh, which maybe we're not able to fully access and, and quantify at this point, but at some point we may be able to. And if that's true, then they can become part of a rigorous quantitative taxonomy, divorced from the question of whether or not it's alive or not. I mean, that, that that's, that's important. Arbitrary. Yeah, that's the important point. I like the last part, whether or not it's alive. I don't I'm, I have nothing against measurement. I think measurement's a great thing. I think you're right about it. But the question is, what do you measure? Uh, what's the relevant measurement? And, you know, you have different uh, you have different qualities or different properties that you're measuring. And the question is, what is the right property to measure? Uh, not the question of whether or not you can come up with a good measurement. Because if you right measure the wrong properties, uh, then yeah, you've got great measurements, but you haven't really got an answer to your question. All right. Okay. Should we go on to take some questions from the audience? All right. So the, here's one for Bob. Bob, you make much sense. So you're good to know, right? <laughs> That's good. Life uh, may be richness of chemical interactions phenomena. But where does consciousness begin in mammals, in humans, from which species of homo? So that's a real tough question, especially for mineralogists. Because there's, well, anyway, let me, let me go on with that. You go with it. It's, it's easy for me because I know so little about the subject that I can make something up as I go along. Okay. And, and what I say is, again, as a scientist, you want to be able to measure something. If you can measure it, if you can quantify it, if you can somehow put parameters on it, then you can talk about distinction. And my understanding of consciousness at this point is it's difficult to study scientifically because we do not have a quantitative measure of consciousness. Now, Carol alluded to this very nicely. She said she thinks her cat is consciousness. And I've seen experiments with octopi that are just incredible where they look in mirrors, they, they manipulate things, they learn. You have a feeling they're consciousness, but, but what's the parameter that we can use to quantify that? Um, I think it's certainly true that in our own experience, from our own perception, humans have a higher level of whatever it is we call consciousness than, than other organisms that we've met. Um, and it, maybe that sets us apart in some qualitative way. But quantitatively, scientifically, I don't know how you measure this. And therefore, I don't know how you fold that into a rigorous taxonomy of interesting chemical states. Can, can I say something? Yeah, so a really interesting a uh, paper was written, I think it was maybe 15 or 20 years ago, by a philosopher named Nagel called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And that paper, I thought, really captured the essence. I recommend it to anybody who really wants to understand what philosophers call the problem of consciousness, called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Um, and it's by a man named Nagel. And here's, here is the interesting question uh, that he raises. The essence of consciousness is the subjective nature of my experience and the subjective nature of your experience, Bob, and your experience, Marcelo. The problem is 
that when you measure things, you're dealing with objective experiences, experiences that can be shared by others, where we can both take a ruler, this is a simple-minded case, and go measure uh, the height of a tree um, or the uh, height of a person. Uh, and we can all agree by looking at the ruler that that's the height of that person. But that subjective character of experience doesn't allow you to get into somebody's consciousness. It gets you into their brain. You can measure the, uh, you know, can measure synapses firing. You can measure various structures in the brain, the size of them. But what you can't do is measure that subjective character of experience. And that's the essence of why it's called the subjective can, uh, it's called, what is it like? What is it like to be about? Because there's something about consciousness, which has to do with what it's like to be something. And how do you measure that? That's the central problem of consciousness. You can measure the brain all you want, all kinds of details, get the structure right, look at it temporally, the activities in the brain, what synapses are firing, where the, you know, the various uh, chemis chemicals are, uh, you know, neurotransmitters are doing their thing, but you haven't got the subjective character experience. You still don't know whether that brain is having subjective experiences. So that's the heart of the problem of consciousness and why I think it's so hard. Yeah, let me say to people that uh, are interested in this, that our very, very first public dialogue was on the mystery of consciousness. And we was with uh, the philosopher David Chalmers, who is the guy that coined the, the, the hard problem of consciousness, and with the scientist Antonio Damasio, who is doing experiments on trying to figure these things out. So we've done that. That was in that was in those days was a live event in New York. But uh, so it's it's one of the things that we have archived. And as a segue here, since we're going that way, um, I think this one is at least initially for you, Carol. Let's see. Is <clears throat> is life a matter of definition or a look from an existential point of view? there will always be something that will touch human existence. So it's a little vague, but the question is, is it because we are humans that we have this need to define what life is, I guess? Uh, is that something related to us because we have an awareness that our time is finite in this planet? And that makes the need for us to really kind of grab onto this concept of life as finitude, so to speak. I mean, that's my interpretation of the question anyways. Well, I hate to tell you, but I'm an analytic philosopher, and so my answer is probably not going to satisfy the uh, person who asked the question. But um, we've been obsessed by definition since Aristotle. Aristotle was the father of definitions. He's the one who came up with the concept of a definition. Before then, people didn't uh, see any need to come up with necessary and sufficient conditions. Aristotle wrote whole treatises on this. And uh, in a sense, uh, mathematics is about definitions. But of course, the uh, issue about math, I mean, you come up with, it's easy to provide a definition for an axiomatic system, because all you do is do a conjunction of the axioms. So you have the axioms, of, say Euclidean geometry, and you do a logical conjunction of them, and you've got the system. And nothing outside that system uh, is part of it. That's why uh, there was so much attention many years ago, not that many years ago, when I was in grad school as a math major, to the continuum hypotheses, the question of whether or not there was an infinity between the natural numbers and the higher order infinities, whether L sub one was the first infinity. There was a, there was a huge debate uh, about the uh, continuum hypothesis. And um, there was a proof that it was independent of the axioms. And then that was a great thing because it meant you could either add an axiom or not an add, add an axiom. And it was just a matter of doing that. But science is not like mathematics. Despite all the talk about science being the queen of science, it's not mathematics. In mathematics, you have perfect information. That is to say, you're given the axioms, and the only legitimate things that follow are what you can logically deduce from the axioms, namely the theorems. And so uh, in mathematics, um, you, you know, you, 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 have all you need to know and nothing surprising happens. The theorems are sometimes surprising, but they're really not surprising. They're just surprising because it takes a long time to figure out how they flow from the axioms and the other theorems you've proven. But in nature, so for example, um, you talk in statistics about taking a bat, which has you know black balls and white balls, and statistics is based on how many, once you know you have 70 white balls and 
uh, 30 black balls, you know, what's the probability of drawing a white ball when you mix them up? So there you have perfect information. But the problem with nature is you read in, reach into the vat and you think you're going to get a ball, but you might get a frog. Or you might get a quartz crystal. The vat of nature, we don't know all that's in there. And so that is, I think, the central problem with definitions and, um, and why they don't work very well in science. Yeah, good. I have a question which is more grounded, um, which I think is important right now. <laughs> Let's reel this back in, um, which is what is the ideal experiment each of you would do, it's a tough one, to determine if an object exhibited life on another world? How would you go out there and figure it out? So for me, the answer has to do with very much what Carol has talked about in terms of anomalies. That if one thinks about a non-living environment, you're driven in chemistry, at least, by thermodynamics. You're going to find states, atoms, the condensed phases that are there, the, the liquids, the solids, are going to be driven by finding chemical equilibrium. Life seems to do things chemically in a different way because each of the molecules of life has to have a purpose. It has to have a function. And so you're driven to select molecules, a subset of all the possible molecules that actually achieve some kind of function. So this is what proteins do. This is what DNA and RNA do. Those are important biomolecules. They wouldn't occur randomly on, on a non-living world. But if you had a living world, something about the chemistry of that world is going to show you this selection of a subset of possibilities on the basis of function. That's to give you structure, stability, uh, competitive advantages, whatever. So I think it's suites of molecules that are idiosyncratic. One of the types of idiosyncrasies has to do with handedness, the fact that in nature, when you just basically synthesize molecules, normally you have equal numbers of left and right-handed molecules. But at least life on Earth, and I suspect this is probably true if it's carbon-based life on other worlds, you select for one of them and not the other, left-handed um, amino acids, for example, right-handed sugars for, for just biochemical reasons because they're more functional. And so function drives idiosyncrasy. To me, that's what I look for. Hmm. Okay, that's a very good answer. Carol, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I'm a philosopher, so I don't perform experiments. And so it would be kind of uh, awkward for me to, I think, uh, come up with one. But what I would do is look for an anomaly, something that shouldn't be there, that was potentially biological. And then I'd call up Bob and I'd say, hey, Bob, we've got this anomaly. You want to take a look? Right. Yeah. And Phosphine on Venus. Phosphine. You know, and that brings me to... Um, differentiating uh, between living and non-living because we actually talked about this before and we didn't really touch upon it, but I think it would be really useful if we did, which is, you know, people talk about fires and we talk about hurricanes and having, as having some of the characteristics of living systems in the sense that it is absorbing energy and, and new, you know, oxygen, at least from the environment, it is, it is multiplying, spreading, um, so where do we draw the line? I mean, if we had to kind of define these things and why is it a hurricane or a fire that is spreading out a living system? So again, Marcelo, you're talking about a question of taxonomy. Yeah. These are natural systems that display interesting phenomena and we could call them growth and we can call them reproduction or we can call them using energy or you can even have aspects that are analogous to what we call metabolism and catabolism in in, in living things, we, but why, you know, to say there's an absolute line in which you say everything on this side of the line is alive, everything on this side of the line is dead. To me, this is the point. Now, I wouldn't put in my taxonomy, hurricanes would not fall under the, uh, you know, the vivo section, but they are interesting self-organizing systems. And I think self-organizing systems in nature really are absolutely fascinating. And they're a critical aspect of the cosmic chemical evolution that started with the Big Bang, continues through today in the formation of stars, the formation of planets, the formation of the periodic table, um, the formation of various kinds of, of large scale and small scale phenomena on a planet like Earth, and ultimately the origin of life. These are all self-organized chemical systems. And so cosmic chemical complexity is 
worthy of study and taxonomy in its own right without having to predetermine that there's a label of some things that are called live and some things that are called dead. Mm -hmm. Carol? So I think it. I think the hurricane and tornado thing is interesting. I note they last longer than mayflies. So some people go, well, they don't last that long, but they last longer than mayflies. <laughs> the the day. Um, but there is a. I think that one of the things that differentiates them is a that living things have a different kind of independence of their environment. They aren't independent of their environment. They're dependent, but they're dependent in a different way than hurricanes and tornadoes. Um, and so I think that if I were going to explore that distinction, uh, and I agree it's a matter of uh, classification, but I think, and I think the danger is premature classification. So Bob, I think is pushing that we just don't wanna have any classifications right now. But as he said, when he held up his crystal, um, for certain purposes, uh, being a crystal quartz as something independent in the environment is important. And so, we do want to get that kind of an account eventually of life. But I think there is, uh, and again, I would ask a biologist and maybe Bob and other people to look at this, but there is a difference. And I'm just going to take a stab at it. You know, living things, they feed on certain kinds of stuff and then they can go far on kind of automatic pilot uh, as long as they're, you know, there are the right other conditions present to serv uh, and survive. There's a sense in which I think tornadoes and hurricanes are much more closely coupled with environmental conditions. But I'm not a meteorologist, and uh, I can't say exactly what that difference is. But I think that might be a way of pursuing the question you've asked, Marcelo. Can I throw a wrench and just to conclude this conversation? And, and you can shoot me down as being silly, which is fine with me. But do you think that perhaps the the boundary here between the living and the non-living, in particular in these kinds of self-organizing non-equilibrium systems, um, has to do with purpose. Like, like living systems have a purpose to kind of remain alive and they act according to that. So even a bacteria that has chemotaxis that is moving towards where there are more nutrients, there is, there is some sort of autonomy and volition in there that you do not see in hurricanes and fires and things like that. To me, and I could be completely wrong about this, but to me, that's the missing link, perhaps, in, in, in this. That's the problem of teleology. And the great Immanuel Kant. It's not teleology. Uh, is it teleology. Teleology is the problem that life seems to have an end, that um, it has a purposefulness that mm -hmm. natural systems don't have. And the problem with the notion of purposeless or um, having an end is it seems to involve a kind of self-causation, which you don't see in nature. That is to say, somehow the organism already knows, and development's a classic example, when organisms develop, somehow it's as if they already have a blueprint, which they do actually, uh, for what the adult will look like. And then when you have a living, breathing organism, they have uh, a purpose on going and feeding uh, tornadoes and hurricanes just follow the trajectory uh, that uh, nature has provided with, uh, that is to say, the atmospheric conditions and oceanic conditions. But uh, Immanuel Kant, who uh, was also the discoverer of the nebula, he was an astronomer as well as one of the greatest of philosophers, said there will never be a Newton of biology because natural science uh, only works with uh, uh, a linear concept of causation, of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And biology exhibits this circularity of causation. Organisms are able to, in some sense, cause themselves. Uh, and so that's the, uh, now the problem is, um, that's a really hard concept to make sense of. And many people think Darwin solved it because Darwinian evolution says, oh, that's true. And the blueprint is in the genes. But of course, it's not that simple because we are doing things, uh, organisms do things that are not directly coded for in their genes. But it's a, a deep puzzle and the concept of truly circular causation that can't be broken down into linear cause and effect relationship is one that uh, nobody has actually been able to make very good sense of. People talk about emergence. Emergence has that problem too, the concept that at a certain level of complexity, new phenomena emerge but the problem is once they emerge, 
then potentially they can affect the very grounds that set their emergence and there you've got the circular causation and if they do that how can they emerge because you can change the grounds that produce them so it's a deep problem this notion of self-causation and that's why Immanuel Kant one of the greatest minds I think um, that ever was said that um, uh, certainly in philosophy uh, and he was also as I said an astronomer said that there will never be a Newton of biology now I reject that but it was a really interesting argument and it's always stuck with me uh, after having been tortured through the critique of pure reason. And believe me, you don't want to read it. So, so Marcelo, I think when you use the word purpose, what you're really talking about is the parameter of time in the context of the cosmos. Because purpose implies that you are leading to something, leading from something to something. Now, does a quartz crystal have purpose? Well, in the sense of the second law of thermodynamics, yet you're minimizing the the energy of a system by assembling atoms and molecules that otherwise would be a random mixture into something that's much more orderly. And I suppose in, in a very abstract sense, you could say there's a kind of purpose to that. Um, the question is, are we missing some additional law when we look at life? Is life just another example of this organization of, of atoms and molecules into a system that more efficiently uses energy or that, that the energy can flow through in a more rapid uh, path? Is that really just part of the second law and that's the one time directional law in the universe? Or is there something we're missing? And so I think this whole question of purpose and something that the Templeton Foundation has really been uh, thinking about a lot, and I know you have as well, is, is somehow is this directionality of the cosmic chemical evolution where we do see emergent systems of increasing complex where each stage of emergence leads to uh, attributes that were not necessarily even predictable by what came before and and are a collective phenomena that that is quite different from the attributes of the individual agents that are interacting so so i think if there's any aspect of your question that can be studied scientifically has to do with a greater understanding of cosmic chemical evolution and the emergence of this complexity at various stages along the way. Yeah, but, no, that's, that's, but no, that's not the same as agency. Increasing complexity, increasing complexity is not the same as exactly, agency. Exactly, exactly. That's a very important distinction, a dis, a distinction because, you know, a, a crystal will not react <laughs> With volition to a change in its environment, you know, and and a fire won't either. If the fire is burning down the hill that is going to end up in the ocean, it's not going to go. Oops, okay, guys, let's turn back because we can't burn this way because there is water there. But a living creature would do something to kind of oh, that's not the way to go. You know, if I don't go that way, there is no sugar I can eat or whatever. So it's, uh, it's fascinating to me, this question. And in fact, that segues into our final question that I will adapt here from, from the audience. There are quite a few of them, but this one is particularly interesting because it's, I think, a very common confusion that people have about um, Darwinian evolution, which is, and I'll adapt, you know, the person is asking about search for extraterrestrial intelligence um, and is asking if intelligence is sufficient and necessary for life. And, and there are many ways in which you can read this question. One of them, which is the one I like because people make a mess out of it, is just, is life always conducive to intelligence? To, by intelligence, I mean sophisticated intelligence. Like if you wait long enough in a planet that has life, is that life gonna become intelligent to, at least in our case, to create you know poems and radio telescopes and, and write books? Or is it not like that? I think it's not like that. I think you have to say that because we look at life on Earth, it was microbial. It was single cell life from more than 4 billion years ago to perhaps 700 million years ago. So, so that's what, 3.3 billion years of a microbial planet. And then, yes, indeed, there was ultimately uh, multicellularity and in the context of evolution, very rapid, the last 700 million years going from the first simplest multicellular organisms to to various terrestrial biosphere and all the complexity of life we see on Earth today. I don't think that's at all a given. Um, I think my microbes may be more d 
deterministic if you have an Earth-like planet, but I don't even, you know, that's just speculation. Yeah, Carol? So I want to distinguish intelligence, consciousness, and life. Three different concepts, which in our life, natural life on Earth, are mixed, but we don't know whether in other contexts they will necessarily be mixed. Again, it's reasoning from a single example. Uh, I think um, I it's possible to create really intelligent robots. When you look at Deep Blue, you know, we have chess playing, checker playing robots that beat humans. And uh, I've heard there's now one that beats somebody, I think it's Go, which is supposed to be a really hard strategy game. And perhaps we could, we could imagine modules, many, many modules. So now we have general intelligence and they're able to do this. Are they conscious? I don't think that's a given. And I think there are lots of conscious beings that probably aren't real smart. Mm -hmm. uh, so the issue, it seems to me, is not to prematurely think that all of these three concepts are linked together. That's an uh, issue, I think, particularly intelligence and life, uh, that is worthy of exploration. I think uh, AI is doing a really good job of that. I think AI um, is exploring what you can get uh, in terms of t intelligence, but it's not at all clear it's life. So I, I think that some AI people just assume that, oh, well, look how smart these systems are. They must be on the verge of consciousness. And if they're conscious, they must be life. It's not all it's obvious to me. We might be visited by robots. Some people think we're going to be you know, robots or intelligent robots are most likely the aliens will run into. Um, I'm not sure that these are anything but machines, tools for perhaps a long uh, dead uh, alien civilization are just running on their own. It's just not clear to me how these three concepts make up. All right. So I can't resist. One more. Um, so what are your thoughts? And then we close. What are your thoughts on intelligent life elsewhere in the cosmos? My thoughts are that um, I think there are, I sound like Carl Sagan, billions and billions of solar systems with planets. Uh, so probably there is intelligent life somewhere else in the universe. But I think if the current laws of physics are um, actually correct, that um, we're never going to be able to visit it. I think it's probably distant from us. I think uh, the signals reaching us from uh, even within our own uh, galaxy are going to take so long traveling at the speed of light, assuming that is a true limitation, uh, that by the time we uh, receive it, the people, the creatures that sent it are long gone. And by the time we respond and get a response to our response, we are long gone, the people who sent it, and probably uh, extinct. Uh, now, are there robotic uh emissaries running around the universe sent by these creatures to explore uh, other worlds. Maybe we'd run into those. I don't know, but but I'm kind of skeptical. Although I have to confess that I'm going to sound really weird. I've read some recent stuff about UFOs that are very striking. They do some pretty weird things. And I've wondered. Uh, and it's really odd that nobody talks about it much at SETI, uh, to be honest, because you have pilots talking about these um, things that they, you know, these vehicle, these um, phenomena they converge on that take off at radical angles at incredible speeds and then hover. Uh, do I think these people are hallucinating? There are enough of them, it seems to me unlikely. Do I think it's a natural phenomenon? Well, if it is, it seems to violate some of the laws of motion that we know. So I just don't know the answer to that. I'm open. I'm open to it. And I wish it were true. Uh, yeah, I want to believe, right? Is that I want to person? believe, yes. <laughs> but it's an, let me put it this way, because I'm really big on anomaly. They are an anomaly worth exploring. Mm. What about you, Bob? What do you think? I echo what Carol said. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies, many with hundreds of billions of stars. Typical stars have planets. Um, I did a quick back-of-the-envelope calculation that there's something like 10 to the 23rd Earth-like planets in the known universe. And those planets tend to live billions of years with surface experiments going over vast amounts of area, chemical experiments going on constantly. I wouldn't study the origin of life if I didn't think it was a deterministic aspect of the universe. Because if it's only happened once or a few times, then you're wasting your time in the laboratory. Whether we're going to be able to actually reproduce those phenomena, the origin of life in the laboratory, and whether 
origin of life leads inevitably ultimately to intelligent life is a much, much more open question. But I have to be optimistic about that and think that that's going to be one of the great discoveries that future generations will make. Awesome. I think that's a perfect place to stop. And I thank you both very, very much. I think this was a fascinating conversation. I hope everyone that is listening to us from wherever uh, agrees. And um, thank you again. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Great.